evening. Good evening. On the outer plane must only be done <coughs> as an outer activity of an inner urge. In other words, even to the simple things like marketing and shopping, these need not be human activities humanly performed. They can be our inner life outwardly expressed. In order to be perfectly harmonious, they must be the inner life outwardly expressed, and this can only be if the outer is performed as the direct result of an inner urge. In other words, whenever we are called upon to do anything, write a letter, go to business, make a decision, our wisdom should be to have this few moments within so that we may feel the click, the contact that assures us that the presence is going with us on this mission or going before us to clear the way of all obstacles. There is nothing truer than I can of my own self do nothing except the fact that the Father within me can do the works. But the Father within only does those works as we release it, as we make way for it to take over our experience. There is a deep secret in the spiritual life, and that is this. God knows nothing of our pains. God knows nothing of our lacks or limitations. God knows nothing of our discord. And so there is no use of going to God for any relief from these. If God had any awareness of disease or sin, God would care for it long before we could ask that it be done. It is only because in the realm of the real that these discords of sense have no existence that God can do nothing about them. God can know nothing about them. They have no existence in the realm of the real. That does not change the fact that we suffer from them. The unreality of evil in the real doesn't lessen our pains or remove our lacks or limitations because to our sense of things we suffer. The beginning of wisdom is the realization that these conditions do not exist in spirit. And therefore, freedom from them comes not from seeking relief from God. Freedom comes through seeking God. 
There is no such thing as freedom from discord. There is no such thing as freedom from sin, from false appetites or desires. There is no such thing as freedom from poverty or concentration camps. There is only freedom, freedom in God, in spirit. Now, the understanding of this changes the nature of prayer. Let me go back a moment to the subject of power. Our instinct in prayer is to turn to God for God's power to overcome, to heal, to reform. We seek in prayer ordinarily, the power of God to remove these ills, whether physical, mental, moral, or financial. In that we have heard, God is not that type of power that overcomes discord, that removes fears, that heals diseases, or removes or uh, <coughs> reforms sinners, or restores wasted bodies. God is not that kind of power. God is the power of being. God is infinite being, self-created, self-maintained, and self-sustained, infinite, eternal, harmonious being, and that is the nature of God power. The nature of God power is being, perfect being, forever being, eternal, harmonious, joyous being. To turn to God, expecting God to be some other kind of power, interferes with our attainment of harmony, of freedom, of peace, of joy, of safety, security. Never go to God for safety, for security, for peace. Give up the desire for these things. There is only one legitimate desire, to know God. To know Him is life eternal. It doesn't say a word about having to do anything after you know him. Acquaint now thyself with him and be at peace. To know him is life eternal. Ah, not to know him and then uh, through some power or favor have peace, joy, and dominion given to us. No, no, no. Having him is uh, the joy, peace, power, and dominion. To stand in the presence of God, to stand in the conscious realization of God's presence, is to be in possession of infinite harmony, peace, and joy. No one could ever want more than the presence of God, because the presence of God is all-inclusive. The presence of God includes within its being 
a state of freedom. He shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And God is truth. You shall know God, and God shall make you free. The knowing of God is the freedom. Now, let us come back to Brother John for a moment. John of the Gospel of John, chapter 4. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldst have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Probably it seems strange that Jesus was wearied. He just never got so absolute, I guess, as not to be wearied once in a while. There was no sin in being wearied. The blessing was that he knew how to refresh himself and where. And from what source came the fresh inspiration? And then, we have reference to a water not drawn from a well, but drawn from his inner being. Now that is the water, that is the refreshment, and that is the inspiration that I meant when I said that from now on we should undertake nothing without drawing from that source, without a contact from that source. Whether it is the simplest experience of daily living or whether it is the most profound, the source must be spirit in order 
that the result be harmonious. Now, the woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. I do not know the meaning of that passage that salvation is of the Jews. I don't know whether or not that was merely said in the same way that we often believe today, many, that Christianity is the only way to God. Probably because in those days the Jews were the only people worshipping, at least the only people in uh, the area of the holy city and even across into Europe, they were the only people who worshipped one God. And perhaps it was because they were worshippers of one God that they were or considered themselves the only ones able to bring salvation. Whether or not that's true, I do not know, because that passage itself is not known to me. But here we come to our message of tonight. Ye worship, ye know not what. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, the second step of our unfoldment tonight reveals that we must not go to God for anything except spirit. We must not expect God to know our human need nor to supply it. But in the filling of ourselves with spirit, we interpret spiritual substance, spiritual life, spiritual law in terms of our everyday need. That is how the healing even of the body takes place not because God knows of a sick body, not even that God knows of a well physical body, but that as we rise above the concept of the physical into the realization of the spirit, everything on our level of consciousness is transformed into the higher showing forth of harmony in our very language. In other words, God speaks to us in spirit, and we interpret that in terms of a healthy body or a healthy purse. But going to God for a healthy body or a healthy purse 
would be like going to God and asking him to speak to us in English or French or German or Hebrew. It does not lie within the realm of possibility for God to select a language to speak in. The language of God is spirit. And how we hear it represents our interpretation of it. And so it is the language of spirit, the language of God is spirit, but so is the body of God spirit. And so is the wealth of God spirit. And so is the relationship between individuals and nations spirit. Now, as we seek God in spirit and find spirit and truth flowing in and through and as our consciousness, that becomes interpreted on our plane of existence as harmony. For instance, we seem to be a hundred people or so in this room. And we are, from the human standpoint. But looking at us from that same human standpoint, each of us has a life of our own with problems of our own, language of our own, backgrounds of our own, and uh, all virtually strangers to each other. And yet, we know that to say that would be judging by appearances because we know that the very something that brought us together in this room was a spiritual bond and no one can see a spiritual bond. We have come from all over the United States and Canada to be here together. Were we drawn here by anything visible, physical, material? And you all know the answer. We were drawn here by the power of the Spirit. And we were drawn here for one purpose, to imbibe of the Spirit. And yet here we seem to be in physical embodiment. Yes. Yes. The Spirit acted, and we translated that action into airplane or train travel and arrived here. The Spirit acted to draw us together. Now the same Spirit that acts to draw us together is forever in operation to draw us unto our own, whether our own in human relationships of home, or business, or nation, there is an invisible activity going on that would draw us to our rightful employment, or our rightful marriage, or our rightful city, or our rightful nation. Ah, but you see, before we came here, We all were praying, each of us. And what were we praying for? We weren't praying for, let us say, Joel Goldsmith, and we weren't praying for the infinite way. We may not even have known them. But we were praying for light. We were praying for truth. We were praying for spiritual guidance. And now see where it brought us. It brought us here together in an infinite way message. In other words, our desire for God, for light, for truth, brought us humanly to this book, set of books, person, teacher. Ah, but let us remember this. If when we prayed for guidance, in our family relations, 
business relations, national relations, if we pray just as hard to know who to vote for on election day as we pray for guidance in finding our spiritual teaching, we would always be led to cast our ballots in the right direction. <clears throat> if we sought spiritual guidance in every activity of our experience, not translating them into the human, leaving them right there as we have done with this guidance that brought us here. Just give me light, spiritual light, truth, unfoldment, revelation, illumination. Why, we would not only be illumined to find our teacher or teaching, we would be illumined to find the right dress or the right suit or the right apartment. Because there's no difference in these things in uh, the scale of God. God is fulfillment. Remember that statement. God is fulfillment. God fulfills. The presence of God fulfills. God cannot come to you and bring you to your correct spiritual teaching and not come to you and bring you to your correct employment or your correct home. God cannot be divided. God is not divisible, nor does the activity of God include one thing and leave out another. God could not reveal itself to you as health and then leave out supply. God could not reveal itself as supply and leave out health. Ah, but you say my experience proves that just that very thing happens. I sometimes pray and get my health and do not get my supply. I sometimes pray and get my supply and do not get my health. You pray amiss because you're praying a divided prayer. You are praying for things or that the Spirit reveal itself only in certain directions instead of that God reveal itself as light, the fullness of light, the fullness of illumination, the fullness of truth. God's garment is whole, complete, perfect. When God places the raiment, the mantle about our shoulders, it includes our entire being. Perhaps you have already read Leave Your Nets. And perhaps you have been, uh, as some have been, puzzled by the last chapter of the robe. There is nothing mysterious about that chapter. It states very clearly in there what the robe is. It is your consciousness of truth. The brown robe is when your consciousness of truth is only that of the initiate, only that of the beginner on the path, a little <laughs> awareness of truth. As your consciousness of truth deepens and becomes enriched, the color changes. It becomes a deeper blue, perhaps, purple, gold, ultimately white. The white robe of Christ, which means the full and complete realization of Christhood. The robe isn't a robe, physically. And yet, the full Christ consciousness envelops one just like being clothed in a robe. And sometimes, sometimes you can see that robe being draped about your shoulders. You can see yourself enveloped in it subjectively, but so completely that you will know then that the robe, the spiritual robe, cannot be divided. 
And so, to pray aright means to worship him in spirit. Worship him as spirit. God is the spirit. Then don't go to God and expect a miracle. Don't go to God and expect a healing. Don't go to God and expect safety or security. Go to God expecting God. Go to God expecting the Spirit to descend upon you, the descent of the Holy Ghost, the Christ, the spiritual awareness of his presence and perfection, harmony, completeness, and watch how it appears outwardly as the harmonies of your daily experience in simple things like finding a parking place just when you're ready for it, in simple things like finding a seat ready on the airplane or train when they were crowded or a room at the hotel, in simple things or in the very deepest experiences of our lives. You will find completeness and perfection by seeking the Father in spirit as the spirit. Don't seek to divide the garment. Don't pray for health or wealth or safety or security or peace on earth. Pray only that God reveal itself as truth. The same kind of prayer that you must have been praying to bring you here to this room this week. Just imagine, let us say, the day before you ever heard the name of the infinite way. And so you couldn't know what to pray for or what teaching to pray for. And so all you could do was turn to the Father and say, Oh, Father, give me light. Reveal truth to me. Reveal harmony to me. And then the next day somebody came along and offered you a pamphlet or a booklet that ultimately brought you here. You see that you were praying in spirit, for spirit, as spirit. You were praying in truth, for truth. Then it interpreted itself to you in this teaching. If there is ever a higher teaching, you will find it. You won't be stuck here on this level unless you keep uh, believing that you must be loyal to Joel of the Infinite Way. I hope you'll never get that feeling. Just keep right on praying for light, for truth, for more wisdom, for illumination. And for a while, it will hold you keeping you going, probably with me. But if the day comes when there's somebody available better for you than me, believe me, it will lift you right out of my aura into that which is right for you. You don't think I would hold you, do you? No, not any more than I would permit anyone to hold me. Only God. Only God. God, give me God. Give me spiritual wisdom, give me spiritual light, and if that would result in taking me out of the infinite way, I'd lead you out. Be glad to. Only God is important. Only God is truth. All that we do is reveal such truth as it comes through to us and in us. But as you have already seen, your prayer for truth has led you this far. Now continue that and seek the whole garment. Keep seeking truth, light, revelation, illumination. Worship him as spirit and let the whole garment descend upon you and reveal itself then, not only in teaching or teacher, but in supply, in home, in joyous relationship. Now there is a bond between us here, 
a spiritual bond that drew us together and will hold us together as long as we are of one mind, as long as we are on one plane of spiritual consciousness, we will be held together in this spiritual bond. Now, as long as that is true, there will flow back and forth between us a bond of love, a love that will be spent felt with a capital L, and uh, it will make it impossible for us, even on the human plane, ever to deceive each other or even attempt it. It will prevent us ever from doing wrong to each other. That is the bond that exists. We do not have to declare, I will be honest, we have to take no vows. We don't have to sign any papers or registers to be honest with each other or generous with each other. No, no, no. There is a bond between us that does that for us. It makes it impossible for us to go in any other direction. But now listen. That bond, that tie, that spiritual tie, is not limited to us in this room. That spiritual tie binds us to every child of God on the face of the earth. It is no tie to human beings or mortals. That is why in the recognition of this truth, those who persist in remaining on the human or mortal level ultimately drift out of our experience. We draw unto ourselves those to whom we are bound, our spiritual brothers and sisters. But those who live and insist on living on the mortal or material plane sooner or later drift away from us, and sometimes our heartache comes in trying to hold on to them. The Master knew about this when he said, leave mother, brother, sister, leave all for my sake, he did not mean to leave those of the spiritual brotherhood or sisterhood. Oh no, he said, who are my brothers and sisters? Ye, my disciples. In other words, our spiritual family remains intact. All who can meet together on a spiritual level of love joy, peace, trust, they will be bound together from now unto eternity, sharing forever with each other. There you will find a spiritual form of communism. It's a beautiful form, too, because we will never be called upon to share anything with each other of ourselves. We will never be called on to give up anything that we possess to share with another. And they will never be called upon to give up anything they possess to share with us. Everything that we share will come from this well at Sychar. Everything will come from the spiritual fount. And it will be of God. Instead of depleting us, it will be like the master's experience of multiplying loaves and fishes and having twelve baskets full left over. Every time we share in the recognition that we are not sharing that which is our own, that we are sharing only that which comes from the Father, we will find ourselves with baskets full left over too. There is no such thing as a depletion when we share or spend from the infinite source. There is only a depletion when we take from our personal resources. It is just like the lifting of a weight. If you measure your muscle and then lift a weight, there is only a certain amount of weight that you can lift. If you can forget your muscles, 
and just realize the source of your strength, you can lift any weight necessary for you to lift at any given moment. In other words, we can meet any demand made upon us, physical, mental, financial, as long as we do not err in believing that it is my strength or my mentality or my wisdom or my pocketbook. As long as we understand that we are reaching into the well of Psycho, into that well that springs up into life everlasting, we can share and share and share. It makes no difference whether we're sharing words pouring out ideas of truth or whether they're dollar bills. It's just a question of how we get used to the idea of drawing forth from that source. What counts is that we understand God as spirit and draw on spirit for spirit. Do not think of God as spirit and then draw on God for supply or for help, or for parking spaces, or for companionship. Don't do that. If you understand God as spirit, draw on God, pray to God for spirit, and then let that whole garment be made manifest in the completeness of our experience. Then, if we need a word of truth, that word of truth will appear as rapidly as we may need it. If we need a dollar bill, it will appear as rapidly as we may need it. If we need this, if we need that, it will appear as we need it, as long as we do not desire it or pray for it. Ah, isn't it marvelous? God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Can you see now why we have so often failed in what we call making our demonstration? Oh, yes. We have looked to God, a spirit, for almost everything in the world but spirit. Now we must get back. We must get back because we have had a revelation. It's really a tremendous revelation. It's all bound up in that one little word, is. Is. God is. God is a spirit. Well, do you know what spirit is? I don't think so. I don't. None of us knows what spirit is. There isn't anything at all that can be measured by your experience or mine. It isn't anything that can be measured by your wisdom or mine. God is a spirit. If we ever do understand it, and I'm sure we all do in some few moments of our existence, it is only when we have transcended the entire human experience, when we have transcended even the realm of spiritual thinking, then we may catch a glimpse in those exalted moments of uh, a spirit. Otherwise, we have no knowledge of spirit, and so we have no way of defining how spirit shall appear to us. Do we know what truth is? No, the master was asked, what is truth? And he just turned and walked away. What is truth? Could you answer? No, you couldn't any more than I could. What is truth? We know lots of statements about the truth. We have read much about the truth, studied much about it. We have even had unfoldments about the truth. But the nearest that I have come to truth itself is that little word is. I know the truth is. That I know. I only have to look out upon this world and see the miracles of 
even what we call natural things, nature, a blade of grass coming up through a stone, a tree growing out of a rock. I know the truth is, even though I do not know the nature of truth. But when I pray, and pray that truth reveal itself to me, I become aware of some activity or form of truth. I become aware of some harmony that is the direct result of the activity of truth. Let us see how we can explain that. You all know the process of planting a seed in the ground. If you could look down into the ground upon that seed with a powerful glass, in time you would see that seed begin to, you would see a movement in the seed and it would break. And pretty soon you would see sprouts coming forth from where that seed had been planted. A bit later, you would see those sprouts shooting up through the earth. And still later, they would become branches or plants or trees. All of this that you would see would be an effect. Never would you see the power that was causing the seed to break open or the sprout to take root or the shoot to come up through the ground. Never, never would you see the power that was causing all that. All that you would see would be the effect of that. And that's what happens to us when we pray the prayer of spirit and of truth. We never see God itself we never witness truth itself, but we see, feel, or witness the activity of that truth, the effect of the activity of that truth. That we witness. We witness the increased health, the increased strength, the increased supply, the increased love between each other. We witness all that, but that is the effect. The cause itself remains spirit or truth. Now, in the moment that we are praying in spirit and in truth, we are not praying for a specific effect because we are not looking to God to become a power to do something. When we pray the prayer of spirit and truth, it is the prayer almost of resignation, relaxation. As if we had no knowledge of what the effect would be, we are just resting in this glorious feel of the divine presence. We rest in this calm assurance. Strange thing to rest in, a calm assurance. We rest in a gentle presence. We rest in uh, a still small voice. Just think, we're not seeking anything. We're not praying for anything. We're not desiring anything. We're resting in an atmosphere of soul. That's our prayer now. Arresting from desire. Arresting from seeking. We're resting in the soul. We're not seeking release from something. We're seeking release in something. In the soul. If only we feel this release in the soul, we will find on the outer plane there's nothing to be released from. If we find our release in spirit, in truth, if we find it possible to rest in him, 
then when we open our eyes, we find that the discords of sense have disappeared. You see, they never existed as actual realities, but only to our sense. But we lost our sense as we found our rest in spirit and in truth. The idea that I'm trying to convey, do not find it simple, is that the moment we go to God with some expectancy of it doing something, we are missing the way. If we go to God just in the sense of resting in God, then we are praying more nearly aright. It's that expectancy of something that is the barrier between us and our harmony. It is as if we were expecting God to be a power to do something. God is a power, but God is a power that is doing it. You see the difference? Instead of expecting God now, in the moment of our prayer to do it, God is and always has been doing it. Therefore, it is only necessary for us to rest in God. Now, since we do not know the nature of God, since we do not know the nature of truth, we do not know how to pray. We are told then, that we must let the Spirit bear intercession, bear witness for us. Let the Spirit make intercession for us. Let Spirit pray within us. In the Infinite Way writings, I have said there that actually we never pray. We merely get into the attitude for the reception of prayer. It is God who prays, really. Yeah. It is God that prays in us. How do I know that? Because when I've been very still, very quiet, very deep in the center of being, I've heard the still small voice, not as a voice, just as a state of awareness, and I knew that God was revealing truth to me. So the Word of God was coming from within me to me. I wasn't doing it, I was receiving it. I was becoming aware of it. In other words, I was a witness to God's activity in me. Now that, to me so far, has been the highest secret of prayer. When I could be still enough just to be a witness to God's praying, God's uttering itself in me. God uttered the word, didn't he? And the whole world appeared. God uttered the word. We didn't, we didn't think that. God uttered the word. And so to me, up to this moment, that has been the highest form of prayer to which I have attained, an ability sometimes to be so still within, so absent from the body and present with the Lord, that I was able to become a witness to God revealing itself, God uttering itself. And sometimes that has come in actual words, and uh, sometimes it has just come in an awareness, sometimes it has come in a feeling. Tonight I was, earlier this evening, I was a little bit desperate about tonight, and I had a tussle with the Father. But this time the voice did come, and it said, pray for spiritual things. And the moment it said that, this came to my thought, this, ye shall worship him in spirit and in truth. And so the whole thing was revealed, and you see then? I was listening and God was praying. Do you see that? 
Can you, can you follow that? Can you grasp that? That we have to come to some place where sometimes through desperation we just know that nothing we can think is going to do any good because it has been said that God's thoughts are not our thoughts and who by taking thought can add to a stature one cubit. And if he cannot by taking thought do the least of these things, why take thought for the others? So why take thought about praying for things, things that we think we need, at least things that we desire, when all the time we know better? There isn't any of us here who hasn't been in this work long enough to know that that form of prayer is not correct. Even when we were praying for some demonstration, we have known that that is not the way. There is only one way. God is a spirit. You see, that is why the thing of praying in holy mountains or praying in that temple in Jerusalem is not the thing. Not that it wouldn't be just as effective to pray in a mountain or in that holy temple in Jerusalem, but the holy mountain nor the temple are necessary, nor is any edifice necessary, nor is any lack of ne edifice necessary. The secret lies in this, that the place where on you stand is holy ground, and that may be in prison, that may be in a hospital, that may be in an insane asylum. Who cares where it is? The place where on thou standest is holy ground. That's the place to pray. Right where you are and right in the circumstance where you find yourself. Don't believe for a moment. This is one of the tragedies that uh, comes to my desk. One person will say, you know, if I just was sure of next month's rent, uh, it would be easier for me to pray and, uh, and to, to meditate and do the right. And the next one will say, oh, if only the sharp pain would leave, then I could uh, meditate, then I could get quiet, then I could do it. And the other one says, oh, if only my house wasn't a bedroom, if only this family would let me out. Not a quiet sanctuary to pray in. And you see, that's sad because the place where on thou standest is holy ground. And it makes no difference if you're in the midst of any kind of a hell, physical, mental, moral, financial. You will find that that is the place right there and then to pray. But of course the secret is to pray as spirit, in spirit, and in truth. understanding prayer or treatment and treatment is a very bad word it's a carryover from metaphysical days we're not really treating disease and we're not really treating people we're not treating discord what we're doing really is praying and uh, the prayer that we're praying is the prayer of receptivity, listening for that still small voice until we hear it. So that the problems that are brought to us, whatever their name or nature, do not, rightfully speaking, call forth treatment. They should call forth prayer. In that same way then, the function of the mind should be understood. Rightly speaking, mind is not God and God is not mind. Mind is a reasoning faculty. Mind is our instrument or avenue of awareness. Through the mind we become aware, or through the mind we even have the ability to reason out, to think. 
I'm sure you'll agree that God neither reasons out nor thinks. God is being. And God is being without thinking it out or planning it out or reasoning it out. But there again, that which we call God consciousness, which is a state of pure being or pure knowing, is impossible to us in our human stage. And therefore, we are given a mind which the activity of which becomes our avenue of awareness, our thinking mind, our reasoning mind, our planning mind. Of course, the wrong sense of it is of the scheming mind and the coming mind. But mind need not be evil, mind need not be cunning or scheming. Mind can legitimately be a planning mind, a reasoning mind, an instrument with which to think out. Perhaps you have had the experience, or perhaps you know others, who have had the experience of giving metaphysical help and then ending up the days with headaches. This happens very frequently in the experience of practitioners, and more especially practitioners who are inexperienced or who do not know that they are misusing the mind. In other words, they sit down to give a treatment and they mentalize in such a way as to bring about an effect for the healing, or reforming, or employing, or enriching. That is not the function of spiritual prayer. That is not the function of the mind. The mind is not a creative instrument. It is an instrument of awareness. We know the truth with the mind but we do not create things with the mind. Even an inventor doesn't create with the mind. He becomes aware of certain natural laws, laws that have always existed. And he becomes aware of how to hook them up, how to bring them together, how to utilize them. The right use of the mind as an instrument of awareness makes it not only a powerful instrument, but one uh, that increases in uh, its functions the more it is used. There was a time when uh, all men who are active in brain power were supposed to get softening of the brain by the time they reached the 70s or 80s if they did. That's why it was said that Ralph Waldo Emerson died of brain disease because he was such a brainy man and used it so much. And in that time, that was a common belief that the more you used the mind, the more you weakened the brain. Of course, the very opposite of that is true except if you use the mind in a wrong sense. And that can easily be done in metaphysical work where people get the idea that just by right thinking they can change this world upside down or they can make somebody be a better body. No, 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 no. No, who by taking thought can add to a statue at one cubit? Who, by taking thought, can change somebody else's disposition or somebody else's character or somebody else's health? Don't try it. Through the mind, become aware of this truth of spirit. Become aware of the truth of God, and that truth will do the work, not your mind and not your thought. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. 
in the activity of your mind to freeze anybody. It is the activity of truth in your mind that frees them. Now understand the mind in that way, and you will find it to be a wonderful instrument. It is the same thing, as I said before, about the power of the muscles. The power of the muscles is uh, wrongly used when the muscles themselves are made to carry the weight. The muscle should only be an instrument for the strength which comes from the soul or the spirit. Then it is the spirit that lifts the weight using the muscles as an instrument. And then there's no limit to the weight that can be lifted. You find that uh, demonstrated in swimming. The harder you use your body, the more vigorously you use your body in swimming, the more quickly you will drown. <coughs> There's any question about that. The only person who stays on top for a long time is the person who is utterly relaxed in the water and just rests on the water and uses the arms and the feet just as a little gliding motion through the water, not to sustain the body on top of the water. Now, most swimmers, inexperienced swimmers, use the body itself and the arm motion and the foot motion to keep their bodies afloat. It is necessary. The water holds the body up if you just relax in the water. And the more relaxed, the longer the body will stay afloat. And then the arms and the legs merely propel the body through the water. Now, same thing. We learned a little trick, if you call it that. It's really a natural law in swimming in Hawaii, that you can swim underwater and breathe underwater. You don't have to hold your breath underwater. You keep right on breathing. Of course, we haven't developed any of us to the extent where we can do it for long, although there are Hawaiians down there who can do it easily for four minutes, five minutes. Stay underwater and breathe underwater. But any of us down there that go out regularly can do it for two and three minutes. And keep breathing. Never hold the breath. Keep breathing. How? By holding the mouth open and just letting the water flow in and out of its own throat. Holding the mouth open closes the throat <clears throat> so the water can't get into the throat. And the only thing that can get by is a little trickle of air. And all without effort. Just in a complete relaxed state the mouth open, the water flows in and out and leaves a little trickle of air so that you can get down underneath and play around with those beautiful rocks and fish down there. The healing work is a beautiful work when it becomes as natural as breathing or floating on water. Otherwise, healing work can be harder than day labor. Anyone who has ever practiced and used the mind in their practice will testify to the fact that they are worn out long before the day is over, tired physically and mentally, and usually with a pain back across the back of the neck, at the base of the brain. Certainly they have been using the mind to try to create something out here in space, to change something in your body or in your pocketbook. That is not the function of the mind, that is not the function of spiritual wisdom. The function of spiritual wisdom 
is to remain relaxed in God and let the spirit flow. Let the truth flow, and then the truth will make you free, or the truth will make your patient free or your student free. The truth will do that. You never will. <coughs> you might call that, too, the true sense of humility. I can of my own self do nothing, so why try? Just let me be relaxed and let the truth carry the work. When you're swimming, let the water carry your body. When you're giving a treatment, let the spirit, let the truth carry the treatment. Don't try to manipulate truth with your mind. Truth is infinite. Your mind is finite. Don't try to manipulate infinite truth with a finite mind. You say, oh, but the divine mind. There aren't two minds. There's only one mind. There's only one mind, and that mind is an instrument of awareness. That mind is an instrument given to you the same as your body is. Your body is an instrument given to you virtually for the same purpose that your automobile was given to you. It's an instrument of locomotion. It's an instrument of, an instrument of transportation. The body is given to us so that we can move around in our present sphere of life. The body is an instrument, and uh, the mind is the instrument of its thinking process, just as the muscles are the instrument of parts of its strength, the organs and function are instruments. The whole body, considered as one whole, is an instrument for our use, and uh, it isn't your instrument or mine, it's God's instrument. We are not to use the body, we are to let God use the body. We are to let God govern and control the body. And when we say that we are masters of our faith, when we say that we are captains of our soul, that's true. When we realize that God is our selfhood, then again, you see, you have that relaxed sense. There is no way of your aiding your digestion or assimilation or elimination by taking thought. The mind wasn't given to you for that purpose. The mind was given to you as an instrument for truth. But truth will govern every organ and function of your body. Truth will strengthen your muscles. Truth will give you the capacity to know anything that you have to know without ever wearing it out. The mind will never be worn out if it is an instrument for truth. The mind will be worn out if you keep using it as an instrument to create something with. Now, you get a perfect picture of the correct use of mind if you can uh, remember any photograph that you have seen of Thomas Edison. There you had the perfect understanding of the use of mind. Whenever Thomas Edison was pictured, it was usually with his hands up this way. He was hard of hearing, but that was not the reason for his hand being up there. Those who worked with him in the laboratory said that he would give them an experiment to work on or a work to do, and they would carry it as far as they could. And then they'd call him in and say, well, Mr. Edison, we've brought it up to this, but we're stuck for the next step. And then his hand would go up here, and he'd listen, and then he'd say, now do this. That is the correct use of the mind. Listen with it. Let it become an instrument of awareness, 
and instead of trying to break your head and worrying about what the next step shall be or what you're to do tomorrow or the next day just get in the habit of doing that and then doing it whatever it is that comes to you make of the mind and of the body an instrument but an instrument of God let God fill the mind and let God fill the body and then all of the organs and all the functions and all of the uh, labors and the joys of the body will be harmonious and perfect you see the wrong use of the body has made people come to uh, almost be ashamed of it as if it were something sinful or to be hidden but the right understanding of body would make it a perfect instrument for our living at every plane of existence there would be nothing to be ashamed about and uh, nothing to be afraid about it would be God's instrument in every form and for every purpose of nature and that is the way we were meant to live not in fear of our bodies and not in shame of our bodies but with the understanding that this body is an instrument through which the father functions on earth we are an instrument of God we are nothing of ourselves except as humans we have separated ourselves in belief from God and tried to be something of ourselves until we've succeeded in believing that we're creators and we've succeeded in believing that we're inventors and discoverers when all we are is instruments we are an instrument through which God reveals its glory the heavens declare the glory of God the earth shows forth his handiwork and so do we the mind and the body shows forth God's glory and God's handiwork and let us understand the mind and the body in that way and then when we wish to help ourselves through prayer or when we wish to help another through prayer we will not make the mental effort of taking thought we will not make the mental effort of thinking what thought shall I think now how will I pray what will I pray for what words will I use what thoughts will I think none of that has anything to do with prayer prayer is a silence in which we hear the voice of God prayer is a silence in which we hear the voice of God don't pray with the mind pray with the soul let the soul pray in you be a witness to it and let the body perform its functions too be a witness to it be a witness to the spirit motivating animating permeating the body be a witness to it it is almost like standing three inches to the right of yourself always and watching everything take place it is almost like standing in back of yourself and seeing yourself function I had that experience one time when uh, <clears throat> I had no automobile and needed one and I was riding around on street cars and buses uh, this is not a right idea of transportation this is not the right sense of transportation there's something better than this I was sitting in a street car thinking that what 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 and as I sat quietly all of a sudden I found myself in back of myself looking at myself from here to here over the back of the seat in the trolley car and there I was from here up and me in back of it and uh, then the words came that is the true idea of transportation instantaneity you're already there and the next day I had an automobile at the use of one you see 
I couldn't have thought that. I couldn't have reasoned that. I couldn't have prayed that. That had to take place as an activity of God within me, and then the activity of God within me made the automobile available to me the next day. I didn't. I had nothing to do with it. It was brought to me, to my office. The activity of truth is the healer. The activity of truth in your consciousness is the healer. You can't think enough right thought to make a demonstration. You don't know what to think or how to pray or what to pray for. So give it up. Give it up and rest. Rest in that prayer. Yes, it's all right if you need transportation and haven't got it to sit down and say, now wait a minute, I have a need of transportation. Now what is the truth about it? And then turn it over to God and let God give you the truth. Don't go on from there and give a treatment in the same way you may find yourself with indigestion and you might sit down and say, well, here, this is a note. I've got indigestion. What about it? Now keep quiet. The truth will make you free. Not any thinking you do about it. The truth will make you free. Now become receptive to the truth, which is the word of God, and then you will find a great secret, a great mystery. His word does not return void. The treatment that you think up might. His word will not return void. His word is quick and sharp and powerful. It does not return void. But be sure that it is his word. You see how we come back always to the subject of God, truth, prayer. It cannot get away from it in this message because it is the entire secret. When uh, we read about giving up self, we mean nothing of uh, what the world thinks of as an ascetic nature. The asceticism we're thinking of is that ability and willingness, or willingness and ability, to sit quietly and let the Word of God come to us, let God use us as instruments. That is the giving up of the self. That is the giving up of the false ego, the false sense of I. The false sense of I would love to use the mind to think up a very complicated treatment. I knew people who told me they have five steps to a treatment. If you leave out one of those steps, the treatment won't be complete. And others had three steps to a treatment. And, uh, oh, what's the use? We had one man one time who, whenever uh, someone asked him for help, said that he gave them a full treatment when they asked for help. And then at midnight, before he retired, he gave them a half treatment. <laughs> and what was a full treatment? Twenty minutes. And a half treatment was ten minutes. <coughs> well, that's fact. He believed it, and he got results in accordance with his belief. As you believe in your heart, so is it unto you. And if you can just believe in twenty minutes, twenty minutes will be God to you. And if you can believe in ten minutes, ten minutes will be a half of God. <laughs> and a half of God is better than none. <laughs> now look, no effect can be God. Is that clear? Whether it's a thought or a thing. I don't care whether you carry a charm or wear a crucifix or a star of David. It's an effect. I don't care how good your thinking is or how sweet and pure it is. It's an effect, and it can't be God. Thoughts can't be God. Right thinking can't be God. Being a good man or a good woman can't be God. Only God can be God. Now, what is God? Now, the moment you try to think, you're wrong. Because if you could name it, it isn't that. No matter what concept of God you could have, it wouldn't be correct. All that you could ever get with the mind is a concept of God 
you couldn't get God. So you might as well be still and let God be God in you. Then you will know God by the effect. Now certainly, you can make a God of anything you wish. You can go to Lourdes and be healed, and you can go up to St. Anne de Beaupre and be healed. You can have mental treatments and be healed. You can take aspirin and be healed. Loads of people are having wonderful results from all these things. But that is not God healing. That is healing on a physical or mental level. And even if you are healed by a right treatment, it is still not God healing. God healing is the word of truth that comes to your consciousness when you are still. The word of God is an activity of the soul within you of which you become aware. You may become aware of it through hearing the still small voice or seeing a light or seeing a figure anyway, or just a feeling or just that deep breath that comes to me. Those are the effects of the Word of God. That's not the Word of God. Don't think that if you see the light that that's God. That's an effect. Don't think if you hear the voice of God that that's God. That's an effect. Never get frozen to an effect. Never become attached to an effect. That is why many people on the mystical path miss the way. They insist they must see visions or hear voices. They must have an emotional experience, not knowing that those are all effects, not God itself. Now, God itself is not an emotion. God itself does not walk around in fancy robes. God itself does not necessarily come in uh, mysterious ways, though it can. Don't limit God. God can set a table in the wilderness. God can open the Red Sea. Don't live in God, but don't believe for a moment that God only comes in mysterious or secret ways. God comes in the very, very gentlest and simplest way, sometimes a touch on the arm, sometimes nothing that you're aware of except that you do the right thing at the right moment. Those all are effects of God. Don't listen for voices as if voices had to come. Don't look for sights as if visions had to come. Those are effects. You're looking around to make 20 minutes become God in a different way. Don't try to make a treatment into God. God is God, and God can appear to you as a treatment, or a vision, or a voice, or an action, or a touch. God can touch you on the arm, God can touch you on the shoulder, and you'll notice that it'll be a very physical thing. But that isn't God, that is the effect of God. Once you seek those effects, you will lose God. Please never get embroiled in seeking an effect. Never try to be concerned how God shall come to you. Be concerned to worship God in spirit and in truth. To worship God as spirit, as truth. And let God define itself to you. Let God define itself to you in any way that it wishes. Don't limit it. Don't outline. Don't expect because you've had an experience today that God will manifest itself the same way tomorrow. Don't do it, because it may never happen again, and you'll just spend a lifetime of misery. Many mystics <coughs> have missed the way because they had a God experience, and they knew all about it and just what it should be, and then they waited the rest of their lives for it to happen again. Some of them have had it happen twice, and a few have had it happen three times. 
But think of all they missed in between by waiting for just those experiences when they could have had God every day in the week. If only they hadn't limited in their own thinking the way that God should come. No, think of God as God, but do not think of any effect as being God. And do not desire God to appear in or as any effect. Be satisfied for God to be God. Let's rest just a few minutes. Now this leads us to something that must become a conscious practice. There must be an effort made to attain this next point until it becomes second nature. You will remember that the basis of this class is the two great commandments of the Master. Thou shalt own all the gods before me. You remember that in that we learn that we must not have idolatry. We must not bow down to idols to worship them. In the ordinary religious sense, that has been interpreted to mean that we shouldn't make graven images, carved images, and worship them as God, but we have a deeper meaning than that. Anything that is an effect that we would rely on, depend on, would be idolatry, whether it were a thing or a thought. Now things and thoughts are not wrong. Things and thoughts are right in their rightful places and for their rightful uses, but not to be uh, thought of as God or as God power. So then, in proportion as we would look to person or thing or thought, For our good, in that proportion, would we be worshipping idols. We would be expecting good from effects. Now then, how are we to come to the point where we really and truly obey that first commandment, since it is so important that it is the first commandment of the great master, as well as the first commandment of the Mosaic Decalogue, how are we to obey that commandment? How are we to do away with a dependence or reliance on that which exists as effect? There is only one way. If you recognize an effect to be an effect, you will not place your faith, hope, confidence, or reliance on it. First must come the recognition of what constitutes an effect. In other words, if the thought were to come to you, what thought should I think? Then the next thought must come in, what difference would it make what thought I think? A thought is an effect. If uh, the thought should come to you, 
I wonder if so-and-so can help me. The next thing must be, ah, but so-and-so is an effect. I must go to God. The moment our thought or reliance goes on anything that is an effect, we are idolatrous. There's an illustration that comes to my mind. Uh, very often we advertise. We may advertise for employment. We may advertise to get employees. We may advertise to sell something or we may advertise to buy something. Now the placing of an ad is legitimate, even in our spiritual work. Relying on it for good would be an error. Then why advertise? To call attention to, to use as an instrument, the same as we would use our body as an instrument to get from here to there. In other words, <clears throat> if I am going to uh, conduct a class in some city, you probably will receive a letter. It won't be an advertisement, but it will be a letter stating that there is going to be a class in this or that city. Now, I can assure you that my hope and faith is not in that letter, and my hope and faith is not in your being there. The letter is only an instrument to make you acquainted with a fact of which you may avail yourself if you like, if it serves your purpose. And if not, that's all right too. The purpose of the letter is to acquaint you with a fact. My reliance isn't on that letter, and my reliance is not on your attendance. My reliance for my good is on my God. Do you make is that clear? Now, I may tomorrow want to sell a piece of machinery that I own, and I may sell it, I may advertise it. I am not advertising it with reliance on that ad to do anything for me. I am using that ad to make somebody acquainted, someone who may have used to that machine, to make them acquainted with the fact that it is available at this place, at this address, and at that price. Do you see that? But my reliance is on God to draw to me. Now then, someone may come as a direct result of that ad. And again, the sale may be made with uh, no one ever being aware of it at all. It makes no difference whether anyone reads it or not. My faith wasn't in it my confidence was in God to complete the transaction. Uh, the instrument, the ad, was merely one of a human footstep of making acquainted. There was an experience told of that some years ago by a Christian science lecturer. A woman had been widowed, and when the estate was settled, it was found that she had enough income to live exactly as she always had lived, except for about $10 a week that she would be short. And so, having this extra room now in the house, in the apartment, she thought to rent this room for $10 a week to make up the difference. And uh, she prepared the room, and then she advertised it. And very few people came, and of those that came, None took the room. And after a while, she consulted this man in his capacity as practitioner, this lecturer, and he said to her, what were you advertising? Well, she had a room, neat, clean, reasonably priced, I said, I guess nobody wanted it. He said, did you ever stop to think, though, how many people are looking for a home 
with love, companionship, joy. No, that was a little different uh, thought to her. But he said, of course, I wouldn't put that in the head. But I think I would go home and see if I couldn't understand that I was advertising something more than just a clean room for a reasonable price. See if in your heart and soul you don't really feel that that room would be a home for somebody. And that with you in it, there would be purity and a good companionship if necessary. Neatness and all the rest of these qualities of good. And uh, she caught the point very quickly. And a couple of days later, a young man came, and he had this ad in his pocket. And of course, the moment he saw the room, that was what he wanted, and he took it. And then he saw her science books on the table, and he said, oh, are you a Christian scientist? She said, well, yes. He said, well, isn't that strange? I wonder why I carried this ad around for a whole week when this is just what I was looking for, but I couldn't come here before today. Yes, you see, he wasn't looking for a room at a reasonable price. He was looking for a home. He was looking for love, companionship. And the moment she had that to offer, then the air became effective. Do you see what I mean? The difference between depending on an air, which is an effect, and depending on love, God, which is cause. Now, it is exactly the same in every department of our existence. First find out whether your dependence is on an effect, even if it's on a treatment. You might even believe that your uh, uh, healing is dependent on a practitioner. You'd be worse off now than if you believed in treatment. You see, your healing, your harmony, is dependent only on God, and God is truth operating in consciousness. Truth active in consciousness. The prayer of communion which makes truth available to you in your individual consciousness. Now then, be sure that you are not depending on a statement of truth, but on truth itself. There again you come to a difference in uh, some metaphysical work and in the infinite way. We do not use statements of truth as affirmations, never under any circumstances, and yet we use statements of truth. And here is the difference. If the thought should come to us, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. And supposing we were to repeat that ten times, that would be an affirmation and it would be a dependence on the 23rd Psalm for what? To make it come true. And that would be an erroneous use of the 23rd Psalm. Suppose, however, that Psalm should come to our thought, the Lord is my shepherd. Oh, the Lord is my shepherd. Mm -hmm. I shall not want. Oh, well, that's quite a different thing. Now I can relax. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And I don't have to repeat that again. I am now relying not on the 23rd Psalm. I'm relying on the Lord as my shepherd. Do you see the difference? I have relaxed myself the moment I remembered that the Lord was my shepherd. But I didn't use the statement, the Lord is my shepherd, to make it so. I didn't declare that he maketh me to lie down in green pastures, hoping that he would bring it about. 
I merely brought it back to conscious remembrance that he does uh, leave me beside the still waters, and that's all that's to it now. I can relax. Or again, he performeth that which is given me to do. You know, you could recite that a thousand times and nothing would happen. But if that thought came to your mind, he performeth that which is given me to do, and you say, he? He? Yes, the Father within me doeth it. Oh, and then dismiss it. Ah, now you're depending on he, the Father within me, to do it. You're not depending on the statement. The statement is an effect. But the he within me, that's cause. Do you see the difference? Now be very careful. Never trust a statement of truth to do anything for you. It won't. A statement of truth is to remind you of something that is already true so that you can relax your fears and rest in the truth that that statement reminded you of. Is that clear? Now that must become clear so that you never, you know, if you get to depending on a Bible, later you'll uh, do what they did in the last war, you'll start putting steel plates in it. <coughs> the Bible won't be thick enough, so you'll get steel plates. After that you'll need uranium linings. <coughs> Always you will be depending on an effect. You see that? And when the Bible isn't thick enough, you'll have to surround it with steel. Well, we don't depend on the Bible. And we don't depend on statements in the Bible. We depend on the source of the Bible. And the statements in the Bible merely remind us of the truth of being. And then it's on the truth of being that we rely. We can safely rely on... Uh, the shepherd, leading us beside the still waters, we can safely rely on uh, he that is within me to perform that which is given me to do. We can safely rely on the he that perfects the fact which concerneth me. But don't rely on the statement because someday you'll find that it's a broken reed. Never, never, never believe in the power of a statement or of a thought, even of a right thought, even of a true thought. Always go back to the cause of that thought, the source of that thought. That's where your power is. That's where your life is, in the source of the thought, in the source of the Bible, in the source of truth in the consciousness from which it emanated. And what consciousness is that? Yours. Even this book emanated from your consciousness. It had to. God is your consciousness. There is only one. There is only one consciousness, and that's God. And God is your consciousness, and this emanated from God. Therefore, it emanated from your consciousness. And even if there are passages in here that you do not know, if you close your eyes when you need them, they'll come right to you. You say, well, that's one I never knew before. That's right. You didn't consciously know it, but you always knew it because you were the very source of it. Thousands of years ago you voiced it because God was the voice. And God is your consciousness. God is individual consciousness. If God weren't your consciousness, we wouldn't be here altogether in one place of one mind. We were only drawn here because each of us has the same mind drawing us together. The same consciousness, the same soul is drawing us together. Now God is your consciousness and God is the author of this book. But you see, God can voice this book in a language that the ancient Hebrews never knew. God can voice this book in a language that the Christians never knew. God can voice this 
in the language of 20th century slang, but it still would be truth, and it still would emanate from the depth of your consciousness. So always remember to go back to the depths of your consciousness for what you want, not to any effect that's in the realm of thought or things.